great information. And that's provided by the Oliver Center, and we're very thankful for that. So without further ado, Sarah, thank you again. Thank you. Okay, so as uh, Tristy said, or Dr. Mears said, um, I am Sarah, just call me Sarah, that's fine. Um, not, not doctor, I don't, don't need that, so. Um, yeah, I've been studying um, sleep and women's health for over 10 years um, in terms of research as well as clinical work and treating patients, and I do have a couple current grants. Actually, I'm recruiting for one that I'll tell you guys about at the end if anybody's interested. Um, and today I'm just going to present, um, I'm going to give you just a brief couple of slides on um, menopause and just some facts about it generally, which I'm sure this audience is expert and can tell me things. And, you know, um, I have a couple children, so I feel like I've gone through some things with hormonal transitions, because any of these periods of hormonal transitions are um, periods when potentially sleep can go awry, like pregnancy, postpartum, even when people begin to menstruate. So I've um, so been through a few of those things, have a few children, and um, feel like I actually had experienced a few hot flashes related to that. Um, but I'm imagining not as severe as how people describe it. So I'm very interested in um, people's stories and patients' stories and actually what, what they would like to see be treated, really. Like, what, what is the, the most important things? Because there's plenty of room to refine what we're doing, and I'm really interested in the people that I'm trying to impact. So I've gotten good feedback so far. We put out a survey and had, like, over 500 people respond with um, treatment preferences and, and what they would like to see. But I've... I really like the interaction of being able to talk to people. So feel free all the way through. And then we'll cover um, insomnia treatment. Um, that's kind of my specialty um, in terms of uh, providing clinical work these days. Um, I've dabbled in different things in the past in behavioral medicine, but now more or less I focus on behavioral sleep medicine and something called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Um, that's in general, um, it's been shown over 30 years of data to show it's like really effective for treating a whole host of populations, including they've tested it in, um, in older aging adults, as well as in pain and cancer. So, so we know it's pretty good at, at a lot of things. However, it's never really been tested in menopause or in women in general, and what are special treatment considerations that, that might, hot flashes for instance. Um, I know I've been informed that some people might be kind of past the point of transition and maybe past the point of hot flashes. It's not the all-consuming thing of my talk. Probably more is just the tips related to helpful tips to improve sleep. So hopefully um, people will find uh, we can discuss that. So the facts about menopause, um, I usually start with this just to give people an overview. And even in uh, therapy, it can be helpful to, um, to kind of realize how it, it, at the first point, it feels very unpredictable, right? Like we've been large and in charge and in control of our lives, our families, our work. And here's this thing that maybe for the first time in your life, um, your body's kind of out of control, right? There's not much we can do. We just have to go with it. And, it, and people have different kind of like different attitudes toward that. So, so I find just some education about it is helpful. So the average age in, in, in the U.S. is uh, 51. Every woman is different, though, you know, like, so even though we have these averages, you know, no, no two women are the same with, with any of this. So the menopausal symptoms vary from person to person, from woman to woman. The um, severity of them, the bother of them uh, vary from person to person. Um, even hot flash, I've been um, training on how to measure hot flashes physiologically using sternal skin conductance. Um, and even that, watching people's patterns of these hot flashes, like it seems kind of predictable in some people, or like maybe every 20 minutes somebody is having it, and you know it's almost you could set a clock to it. But somebody else, it might be how they look looks very different. Um, so it's really interesting and fascinating to me. It's very variable, um, and so they can't just lump us all together in one group. I think maybe that's why things haven't <laughs> worked well so far. Um, Hot flashes typically, the, the research shows that the prevalence is 60 to 80 percent. I hate to say that, it seems pretty high, you know, like three or four out of five people is going to experience them. Now, the level they experience them um, can vary. So, um, And then they typically last three to five years, but sometimes it can last 10 years and beyond. And so that can be frustrating to people because you don't know, like, how long is this going to occur for me? So. 
Uh, and the hot flush itself, I, I like to give a little knowledge about that because sometimes I, I feel like maybe it might help with coping. I know with me, with like pain, I do a lot of adapting to this to pain for some reason in my mind and like the, the literature that's out there on pain. And so um, if I know like how long it's gonna last, you know, I feel better about it. So um, typically they last one to five minutes and typically your own patterns, you can kind of get a sense of what your body does for you. They may last up to 15 minutes, kind of have a spike. You could get very flushed, different kind of symptoms with it. And then your temperature will gradually go down. Physiologically, it looks like kind of like this, like it doesn't even go down really quickly. So it takes a while for it to actually return to baseline. Um, so there's, so I'm kind of testing out a new um, form of my slides to kind of spice it up. And I'm hoping uh, this crowd might appreciate me uh, <laughs> testing it out. So instead of giving you just the boring blah, like facts and all the graphs, I, I've decided to kind of use pictures instead and it, instead of bullets and kind of to depict and it'll prime me to talk about things. So um, kind of took a page from Tristy's playbook of trying not to do too many graphs or bore people with that stuff. I know the science. Believe me, the science is there and I could show you that. I could bore you with that, but, um, but this could be more fun. So, um, so causes for insomnia, I'm sure people in this room can tell us, um, we can go around and people can tell us like what things, you know, you can pinpoint like when it kind of begins. I have kind of city that never sleeps because that's how our, our technology and the world seems to be moving that uh, you can many, many years ago, and I'm not too young to you know remember the days where there was like three channels on TV and that's all you got and at night there was nothing you know and so <laughs> then if you had insomnia you were really struggling because what are you gonna do but now it's like no life's a party right like you can work at night you can be on the internet you can be you know people around the world and corresponding when it's their day so there's a lot to keep your insomnia kind of living which could be good or bad I guess um, and then um, the group of kind of peri and postmenopausal is interesting because they call it kind of the sandwich generation that you could be on any end. So, so beyond the hormonal stuff that goes on and having nighttime hot flashes, certainly that could be a precipitating kind of event that's leading up to disturbed sleep. Um, however, some people that have hot flashes may not have night ones or it may not, and they can sleep. I've seen people sleep right through them when I'm doing the measurements. So. I'm very curious about that, of like how that's um, happening for people, but um, how resilience, but, but yeah, so um, people may not have insomnia as a result of that, or they may have insomnia as a result of other reasons. And so um, people could be caring for aging parents uh, during this time in your life, um, dealing with children leaving the home, or if you're like me having children later in life, the kids are still in the home and dealing with, with all that uh, when you're getting to, to, to the point of transition. Um, work-related stress. It could be really anything that brings it on. I mean, if you think about it, just besides women, just in generally, like it, it's a problem for, you know, 15% of the population has insomnia disorder that actually meets it. And it's higher for people that are just kind of struggling day to day. So if you think about it like, clinically, I've seen all kinds of things that, that have come up. People, you know, fly to Japan and then that jet lag and it set them off and they've never been able to it never bounce back after that and, and it just kind of unraveled and what happened so so it can be a precipitating event that kind of brings it on um, but then as I'm going to discuss it becomes a kind of a life of its own does anyone else have any thoughts about this or like want to share like any things about them that things might have caused trouble sleeping or like any examples? You know, I kind of want to go back to like, uh, you know, uh, menopause. And like, if you say you start your period when you're very young, do you have menopause young? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I think that can vary too. Um, it, it, it can, I, I believe that the, the cycle is um, so, so long, so you have like so many eggs that, that you're gonna uh, produce. So, um, so it could end earlier. And certainly my 51 isn't for, for everybody. I've seen people young, like 42, you know, that have gone through it. So, um, so it's certainly, and then you probably <laughs> wouldn't be expecting it. It feels like it's coming out of left field because like what's going on. But um, yeah, that's really kind of the point I'm 
more learning and taking home from this is that no two people are alike and it's not cookie cutter to fit all with with any of this you know it's a it's a normal natural not medical thing that we all have to go everybody has to go through you know and and how we get there and when it happens you know it, it can vary but yeah it it, um, it, it can kind of uh, bring it the transition on sooner if you started meds use really early in Menarch. Yeah. People that have it for 10 years plus, and I'm like saying, gee, that's terrible. Yeah, I know. one right here. Really? <laughs> yeah, I've got two beside me. I'd <laughs> 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 like to know how these people sleep through the night. So yeah, and I saw it. I saw it and I was amazed. I'm scoring this record, so I don't have the person in front of me, but I have their physiological data. And I'm like, look, they're, you know, like, because originally they're supposed to be kind of responding if they're having them, and that stops occurring, and they were pretty religious about doing it. And I'm like, they're sleeping through. What is it about this person, and what's making them, this person resilient to be able to do that? So that's something I hope to explore further. Um, for my study, I'm actually going to collect this physiological data as well as um, just patient reports um, and see. And the goal of it is to, and we're gonna get into it ab about what the treatment for sleep is, but, but my thought is if we can get people actually sleeping better, give them true deep quality sleep, you, I, and I'm proposing this, I'm just testing it now, but that you might be able to sleep through it that way. If we improve the sleep and get it good quality, that you're sleeping deep enough that minor disturbances won't. And I've seen it happen clinically with Oh, my husband's tossing and turning, and that bothers me. And it's like, well, it's bothering you because you're such a light sleeper and you're, you're not sleeping very deeply. And so my thought would be maybe the, the same thing could happen with hot flashes too. That, um, and we'll see. We'll test it out if, um, if, if that's the case. So, so, yeah, many reasons. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to get to tips that hopefully at least the tips will be to kind of make life a little bit better when it's going on, especially the behavioral tips for hot flashes. For sleep, behavioral, we know we can actually get, it works as well as medication. Hot flash, it's still kind of a new novel area of testing of do we have behavioral things that work. Right now, the gold standard of the field feels is, is hormone therapy, HRT, and it's not for everyone, and they know that, and they're, since Women's Health Initiative, they're trying different doses, different routes, um, playing with estrogen and progesterone, um, and so, that work is, you know, like everything is, unfortunately for the group that's already here, it's hard to, to, to see that, that the research goes so slow for, to get you a better quality of life and, you know, kind of control these things. But, um, yeah, that's kind of where we're at with that. And then there was a recently a, um, paroxetine got approved for, for it's an uh, SSRI, which is an antidepressant or anti-anxiety, but they got a recent indication by FDH for um, for treating hot flashes at a smaller dose. So, um, so there's options, you know, there's options out there if you want to go pharmaceutical route. Um, and then we have these behavioral things and I'll tell, hopefully give you a whole intro about them today and um, hopefully between that, yeah, then, and science will keep moving forward. So yeah, 20 years is not fun, I'm sure. Yeah, and it's it's perfect example of behavior. Your behavior is kind of what's driving and so then we have to make these tough choices. In clinic, too, um, the, the work I do, the CBTI, or cognitive behavioral therapy, it's very short term. It's usually four to six sessions weekly. Um, so I take maybe about two months to get people. So we put them kind of on a sleep program and discuss things like that. Well, maybe you should rethink, like, why are you staying up till 3 a.m.? Like, do you love this movie? And should we watch it earlier? You know, like, what's the reason? And I realize, you know, people constantly, at, at the point of retirement, that's when people come in to see us. You know, it's, it's um, life's kind of like, woo, everything's changed, right? And there's not structure the way it was. And so now it's up to you to kind of define that structure. And especially for sleep, sleep is very, besides the worry, the, the behavior, it's very behavioral. So if you are starting to fudge with things that you might be a little bit that you can get away with, but if you're not sleeping solidly, just even doing small things can really set it out of whack. So, so consequences, which I'm sure if we have all these people here that are having hot flashes and, and trouble sleeping for a long period of time, I, I don't have to discuss with this group too much about, but it's been shown to, and in fact, for insomnia, you have to have some time, something, a daytime symptom um, as well reporting. That could be anything from feeling malaise and tired and fatigued to um, feeling depressed, um, unable to perform at work, fighting with your spouse, or just feeling irritable, you know, 
yelling at people, and you know, I'm guilty of this sometime when I get a bad night's sleep, and <laughs> not my best moment, so, uh, so lots of, uh, <laughs> uh, no, any, no, any medicine, no, nothing. No, a, a better night's sleep would probably uh, <laughs> help with, with some of that, so, so just quickly, I know I don't have too much science, but I wanted to go over our, th our theoretical, kind of theoretical model of what we think is going on with uh, sleep. So people kind of have this pre-morbid kind of genetic predisposition to maybe be a little hyper-aroused or like you carry it in you that um, you could have insomnia. Some people go through life and never have it. So I think probably most of us fall in that category. But what happens, this is the threshold for insomnia. And what pushes you over is usually something we're calling um, a precipitating event. So that's what we just discussed anything. It's related to I retired. It's related to, you know, like I'm going, I'm in the menopausal transition and started having these hot flashes. It's I had to go give this talk and I was feeling nervous about it. It could be anything, traveling on a plane. That event will eventually go away or go down. Um, but what happens is as it's still going on, you're um, getting nervous about it because you're sleeping bad. You start worrying about your sleep. And this is what we call the perpetuating things. And this is what treatment actually targets. So per by perpetuating things, I mean it's uh, what we kind of just discussed, that those behaviors that um, kind of perpetuate the insomnia, they'll keep it going and give it a reason to live, and the thoughts and the worry. So even after the stressor disappears, sometimes um, the insomnia will still be, have a life of its own because of that. So that's kind of the model we work from. And so then cognitive behavioral therapy, what it addresses is unhelpful behaviors so things people, do, I mean, what do people typically do when they have a bad night's sleep? What do you guys, Take something. you what? Take something. Take something, take medication. What else? What are other ways to kind of deal with it? A lot of people don't. And so this lady is the type that's just kind of sitting there and stressing and worrying in bed. If I can just rest here, it's better than getting up and like being awake. So let me just stay here and get kind of quiet time and stay in bed. But meanwhile, you know, she's not asleep and that's not really quality anyways. Uh, other things? Read. Read's a good one. So you guys actually have some good strategies. So, um, so reading can be relaxing and calming. Um, but only if it's a boring book. That's, that's another tip, yeah. <laughs> Boring book. We don't want page turners that are really exciting because that's going to like keep you up. That gives your insomnia a reason to live because you can't put down the book. So I always tell people, we call it non-striving. Anything that's like n doesn't have a purpose or an end, you're doing it for enjoyment. If you're going to have to suffer like this at night, might as well make it enjoyable, right? And not even worry about not sleeping. If not tonight, you know, you'll, it'll come down the road. And if you kind of follow some of the tips, it, it'll get better. So other things are like sleeping in late or hitting the snooze button a bunch. Like if you have a bad night, then you're more likely to sleep in or on the weekend add time. That's actually a bad behavior that'll perpetuate insomnia. Um, staying in bed if you're not asleep. Sometimes people, I don't know, remember what I put this up here to prime me, but uh, drinking very close to, to bed, you know, like sometimes that can help you fall asleep, but it'll wake you up in early morning hours and you won't be able to stay asleep. So it still doesn't solve that problem and then you're, kind of brain waves are, are, are different during sleep on alcohol anyways. And then this is, you can't see really well because it's black and white, but she's napping on the couch, I think, or napping in bed, just taking a nap. So um, napping is another thing that um, you're trying to get sleep wherever you can uh, just because you feel like you need to survive. So you're dealing symptomatically with what's going on, but we're not looking at the big picture. And so these things actually are not very good. What I love about my job and being a clinician is what's intuitive are these things, right? This is what we think we should do. It would be helpful. But what I know, what sleep research for the past 30 years knows is this stuff isn't helpful. That, that um, what we have to really focus on is sleep effort or sleep pressure and actually building that and not extending sleep out. If we, if actually if we extend sleep, I've done a couple clinical trials where that, um, that's our model for actually somebody that's a healthy sleeper to, to kind of impose uh, insomnia on them. We put them in bed for 18 hours, so, or 16 hours, two full, you know, eight hour chunks. And to do that, then we're expecting, yeah, of course they're not gonna sleep, and then they take this pill and let's see if they can sleep anyway. So we test it out that way with like these healthy controls. And so if you know that, like, oh, they're extending you know, the sleep opportunity or that time in bed, and that's how they're causing insomnia, well then, what do we think we're doing <laughs> here? 
not, not good. So, uh, And then the unhelpful thoughts. I'm sure people can relate to this, too. Tons of things floating in the brain. I want to sleep. I mean, you're willing it. You want to will and work. It's just like they say with relationships, like the, the, if you set it free and it comes back to you, you know, it'll meant to be. Or if people know about Chinese finger traps, like the more you fight at it, you can't get out. You really have to more or less sort of embrace your, your symptoms, your insomnia and the sleep and just roll with it. And that's actually really going to set you free. That's good. So it's easier said than done, I know, when you're going through it. But, but that's really our goal of what we're trying to get at. I want to sleep, but my, but my brain is talking to itself. We call it tired but wired. Like you just get in there and you're awake and aroused. And so um, some people have unrealistic expectations that they I want to sleep like a baby. I had a patient tell me that, like, I, what's your goal in treatment? I want to sleep like a baby, you know, and it's like, well, we need to realistically assess where we're at. You're 85 years old, you know, like, I don't know if it's going to happen. So, so, <laughs> so it changes as we age. So, so just being realistic with ourselves. So there's no sweet number, you know, the, the field doesn't know. We say seven to nine hours, and, you know, we don't know each person's sweet spot. It, it, it just, it varies again. So, um, so there's no set number so that, must get eight hours sleep or I won't be able to perform and I'm being evaluated, you know, that thought can keep you up. Like, I'm not going to do well at my job. And those things are, are not, they're com incompatible with, with um, sleeping well. Things to do, uh, running lists through your head. A lot of times you're busy, busy, busy all day, work and take care of kids, get home, do whatever you have to do. First time you have to run thoughts through your head is at night when it's quiet and dark. You may be able to do it in the drive home or in your shower but but you know a lot of people it's when you're it's dark it's quiet you have time to think so unfortunately it's built in that way that you're going to do it. and then you start rehearsing these lists in your head like what do I have to do tomorrow what what's going on problem solving um, this person just a little cartoon time for bed and then the little boogie monster comes out wake up <laughs> think things shut up brain <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, so sometimes it feels like it's out of our control, too. And then this is just, um, sometimes we can have these unhelpful thoughts related to hot flashes, too, that can actually get in our way of coping with it and be kind of hinder us. So, so the fear that it's going to be that much worse if it happens at work, even though I just told you 60 to 80 percent, maybe I'm biased because I do this work and it's kind of like I'm used to it, you know, but, um, but women are very embarrassed about this and I don't know why it's a natural thing that we have to go through and a lot of people go through so um, so why can't we try to do some strategies and just kind of make a joke on it and not miss the meeting because we're afraid that and that might not be everybody but I kind of borrow from um, the anxiety literature of kind of avoiding certain scenarios where you feel like you're under pressure and might sweat more so so I, I briefly told you about um, cognitive behavioral therapy I'm going to grab out my phone so I can keep track of the time because I don't see a clock in this room and I don't want to run far over. Okay. Um, so I, I briefly already told you about it and this is really what I do in terms of therapy. So I address those thoughts and I'm going to actually give you guys a quick run through of all pretty much almost all the tips that I, I do in session and I address the behaviors and ways to improve it. Now I, in, in therapy I'll have like a sleep diary and I tailor it to each person because as we've already been like hearing there's different reasons for it, different things going on so my cookie cutter slides isn't like a one size fits all. I usually do tailor it when I'm in session to like what's going on but I'll give you kind of the gist um, because I think just getting the word out there on how easy this is is helpful. So, so our, yeah our goals are to change some of these beliefs that, that uh, compromise, interfere with a good night's sleep, um, changing the behaviors, and then hopefully to reduce that, that um, suffering and, um, and build hope and acceptance. Um, one side, I said not too much slides on science, but this is just to show you that there is a lot of efficacy of um, behavioral treatment for insomnia. Um, and I have slides to show you that it would be equal to the e efficacy of like um, hypnotics like Sonata or Ambien, those kinds of medications. But our, our main parts are sleep hygiene, stimulus control, sleep restriction, a multi-component, and a relaxation. That's kind of generally what this therapy entails. And we can see the pre-treatment. This is minutes awake in the middle of the night. The orange is pre, and we can see they're all pretty high. And after you know maybe six sessions, six weeks, we got people sleeping considerably better. So, so this is pretty par for the course. Uh, the treatment, like I said, has been tested in all different things. And, um, 
we have about an 80 percent success rate you know I think there's some people that just have special extenuating circumstances that that would need to be addressed too or it might even be higher but um, but it does a pretty good job so so this behavioral intervention hasn't been tested in um, menopausal women it um, right now with the risk with um, HRT the risk at benefit ratio and, and some people it not being a good option for um, people don't always want to take long-term sedative hypnotics so it might not be the antifer but certainly it, it wasn't intended for that when the um, pharmaceutical companies developed it and no published studies have looked at um, CBT what, what I'm going to talk about in peri and postmenopausal so that's the work I'm doing right now though the research I'm doing and so hopefully we'll have some answers and actually definitive empirical data to show that it helps but I'm gonna jump right to the juicy stuff of like what I feel what boiled down to what I think will help your sleep the most so my rule number one is go to bed when sleepy funny when I was uh, Google imaging like looking searching for my slides the only slides I the only images I found on being sleepy were little cute little animals and puppies and babies and I, I don't know if it's because they're so cute or if they if they just do a better job of of showing so in in therapy what I often do is um, ask people if you know the difference between feeling just tired tired but wired and and fatigued and sleepy because they're two different things sleepy is not fatigued um, and I ask you when, when you go to bed. So some people go because their spouse goes or it's 1130 and it seems like time and I, need, I know I need to be up at 630 so I'm just going to go to bed now. And I encourage you to kind of challenge that, that that's not what we like to see um, in treatment. We like to pay, we really want you to start paying more attention to your body's cues of like what it feels like. And so what does it feel like to feel sleepy? Because a lot of people that have trouble sleeping actually don't know what sleepy means because they just feel like they haven't felt it in so long so so here are my clues what, what does anyone have any thoughts of like what what does sleepy mean to you guys <coughs> yawning and yawning mm -hmm. so we got the yawns a bunch of them well, the eyes sleepy. yeah the rubbing the eyes my my babies were always doing it was a what, whatever you know like the the babies like they they can't talk so you, you either have to go by them screaming and that seems to be too late so you're looking for these cues ahead of time and rubbing eyes is often a, a big one but you know if i go if i get sleepy and i go to bed too early like before like at 10 o'clock or 10 30 then i'm up at three or four in the morning yes so there and i haven't and i haven't actually touched in this slide too much i usually do in session you're bringing up interesting things that would make me cause it to be tailored. Um, one thing that I said is important is sleep pressure, or we call it process S, building up our homeostatic pressure. Um, what that basically means is that um, we don't nap during the day, and if the longer you stay up, the more this pressure is building, so you're more likely to have a good night that night. Um, but the other piece of it is process C, which is uh, circadian rhythm, and so it has to occur at the right time. As we age, sometimes, so it can either advance or delay. And teenagers typically, and I've been seeing a ton on like public health and, and the news lately about delaying start times for, for high school students. And really, um, that's because they're genetically, biologically programmed to be a little bit delayed during that point of their life. That uh, they'll want to go to bed a little bit later and get up a little bit later. And there's nothing inherently actually wrong with their sleep. It's just that cycle is what it is. Usually we say it just doesn't match like societal cues. So, and it's not fun to be, and so then at the other end of that, sometimes as people age, they, they will go to the other end a little bit, and they, we call that um, phase advance, their whole circadian rhythm advances. So, so that would be starting, if you pay attention to your cues, and at 10.30 you're feeling tired, but then yes, you're up at 3. The other thing I like to tell people is we have a bank, right? We have a bank of sleep, 7, 8 hours, whatever, we're going to get it. You can use it any way you want. You know, you could nap during the day, but you're borrowing from the bank. You could go to bed at 10, but you're borrowing from the bank. You get that eight hours. Expect that you're going to get up at 3 if you make that choice to go to bed when you're sleepy. And then I, I would do, like, little behavioral experiments with you of, like, there's all these tips we have of, like, trying to keep people awake. You know, it's a sweet spot of, like, not make you too awake and aroused. Like, let's not go run 50 miles, but um, maybe standing up in an ice pack on the back of the head for a few minutes just to get you over a hump of, of the last half hour. Having your husband or a friend, you know, like, 
kind of um, help you with it and talk to you and kind of poke you if you're dozing off uh, to keep you awake till a time. It's all about like trying to get it into the right opportunity too, though, the right window of sleep. So, um, so yeah, that can be an issue if um, you are paying attention to your body's cues and you are feeling sleepy, which could be. Um, exercise. Exercise. Um, exercise is good for sleep. Exercise is good for a lot of things. Don't get into that. Um, mood, sleep. It actually is helpful for hot flashes even. Um, but with sleep, what we, we think is that you should do it maybe about four to six hours before bed. Um, the reason is our, our, our sleep system um, and the circadian rhythm I'm talking about, our body's natural biological rhythm, goes on a 24-hour schedule. And so our temperature starts to drop at night. And then as it gets dark, melatonin, our natural body's natural hormone, um, kicks in. And those things are kind of cues that, OK, it's time for bed. So the body temperature has to kind of drop or that interferes with. And so if it's too high to begin with and you're exercising right before bed, and it's just causing more hyperarousal for, for other things. You mentally, you know, you're more, it's an alerting activity. So I'm always trying to get people to think about their lives and what's alerting to you and what's relaxing. Reading a boring book is, you know, something that's probably soporific, you know, sleep promoting, relaxing, good. Exercising right before bed might be getting the heart running. And, and so just using common sense, really. So I, I'm a strong endorser of it. I think it has synergistic effects and, and helps sleep. Um, just do it earlier, yeah. Preferably, if you guys could do it, like what I recommend to people, if they have any circadian rhythm issues, is first thing in the morning, like go out for a walk and get that sunshine too. The sun resets the circadian rhythm every day too. It's, it's our body's, um, it's a cue for our, for our biological clock. Um, so, so that's great. So, um, so that's my preference, but um, sometimes I have to bring in circadian rhythm issues. And um, these ones are just a depiction of the, the drowsy, glossy eyes, the heavy feeling, you know. I love this. His eyes looked so, <laughs> so glossy. So, um, so yeah, those are just like really the, the cues. And so you can pay attention to, your, to yourself. So you don't want, because it's a certain time, because my husband's going to sleep, because I feel I should, because I'm tired, you know, those aren't good reasons to get in the bed because you're just going to suffer and not be able to sleep. So, which leads me to the next rule. Sorry, it's not the next rule. The next rule is don't stay awake in bed. So if you are going to sleep, um, but and you're just doing it because it's a certain time or you're tired but wired and you think you can go to sleep and you really can't, you could end up lying there for an hour, you know, two hours, not sleeping. So we don't want people to do that. We have what we call a 15, 20 minute rule and it's based on estimate, it's based on, again, your gut feeling. If your mind is actually thinking things, that's a good sign that it's been enough time. We don't want you to be thinking in bed. So our Kind of our theory behind all this is something like Pavlov's dog. I don't know if you've heard of that, but classical conditioning where they paired the dog food with meat, meat powder with ringing a bell and eventually the dog would, would uh, salivate just from the bell. So we think of this, that same model and apply it to the bed in the bedroom. You have now been like this for a while and you're aroused, thinking, working at sleep. Your bed, whether you're aware of it or not, your bed and your bedroom have been paired as a place of arousal and uh, working and worrying at sleep. And so in order to break that, we basically have to get it that you don't spend any time in bed if you're awake. You should be doing it somewhere else, worrying somewhere else outside of the bed. Um, yeah. And now it sounds kind of crazy, like, oh, this is, but believe me, I, I, I got this when I was pregnant. I would go through like periods of like not sleeping good. I would do it myself. This is one I pull in pretty quickly because I don't like to be pained and sitting in bed and just doing nothing. I'd rather, so I suggest to people, what do you do? Well, then do something rewarding. Like don't, don't go do, you know, your work, addressing your emails, internet, go, don't go clean the house. Those are actually, you know, <laughs> things. You want it to be as rewarding as possible. I, I tell people like rent a bunch of, have a bunch of Netflix movies on cue that, that you would, because for me, reading's kind of hard because my eyes are kind of blurry. Don't turn on the main light, just, you know, something. Leave the room and when you're, and then when you start going back to the, the puppies and the sleepiness, when you feel that feeling again, that's when it's time to return to bed. So really just paying attention to that. None of this should be occurring in bed. This should be occurring when you're sitting here and then you take your mind off of it by reading with a comfy book, watching movies. So, what was your laugh about that this is hard or? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. It's not easy. This is not a permanent thing either. Once, like I said, once we get sleep, you know, you give it a month. Once you can tighten your sleep by kind of following these rules and you can soften them a bit, it's not like the rest of your life. You'll see that it starts building that sleep pressure and you'll feel better. So I'm not, I'm not even going to like approach the other one I have because you would laugh even harder. It's, I, I usually just save it for therapy. It's like the boot camp style, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is, I mean, this is kind of the same idea. So basically what we do is um, sort of restrict sleep to build sleep pressure. We're looking to build, build sleep quality. And so it can be done this way, too, because if you're getting out of bed, no matter what happens here, if you get out of bed, if you're out of bed for two hours, which I don't want you looking at the clock because that'll stress you out more, however long you're out of bed, you're still getting up at the same time every day. It's kind of restricting the amount. It's going to build that sleep pressure. You're going to sleep better the next night. So it's always in the spirit of kind of, reducing when you're having a bad night rather than trying to extend it out. So I skipped. So um, avoiding activities other than sleep and sex in bed. So that's kind of a, another rule of if you can avoid doing anything. Some people set up whole nooks or have, you know, a computer that they're using, iPads in bed, phones in bed, you know, like doing so many things. I'm not hardcore. If somebody tells me they read and it's relaxing and they're doing it 15 minutes before bed and then they'll shut off the lamp or, you know, even the TV and then they put it on timer, I'm okay with those things. But if the TV's on all night and the light's flickering and the, the noise, the intermittent noise, like that's no good. And generally, we just don't like to see this because, again, it builds on that conditioning <laughs> principle that, that you're doing things in bed that are other than sleep. So, so the um, getting out of bed um, piece we'll break that, like I'm not worrying anymore in bed, but then how do we, we have, the second piece of it is we have to retrain our bodies to, to sleep in bed, to know that this automatic cue is gonna happen. So, so how we do that is we have to pay attention to our cues and when we're outside of bed, when we feel sleepy, we don't fall asleep on the couch, which I've been guilty of once or twice, that like I, I missed it and just fall asleep, but, but really trying to make that effort to get back into the bed, like eyes half open, lights not on, just kind of quietly, go back into the bed. So that's going to break that conditioning and really help sleep. So questions about this? Yeah. Does a glass of wine put you to sleep or wake you up? It will put you to sleep initially, and then it will wake you up following. Um, what we call it is kind of, we call it a bimodal or biphasal, that um, in the beginning part of the night, it's, it's in you and circulating, so it'll help you sleep. It's a sleep aid. But as it wears off, I mean, every night we're kind of going through withdrawal when you're drinking, like it just uh, is purging out of the system. So as that's happening, your sleep is changing then. So then most likely people that come in and tell me that, like I used to have all this bad like insomnia the first thing of the night and now that went away and now it's in the early morning. I'm like, tell me about your drinking habits because usually that means that they kind of supplemented with that, able to fall asleep and then they're, now they're having early morning awakenings and unable to return to sleep. So, so it's kind of, double-edged sword, I guess. It's, it could be good on the one end, but definitely not. It, it'll be frustrating to be up at 3 a.m. So if you've got a circadian rhythm where you're going to bed early and then you, you drink too, you're double whammy of you're for sure going to be getting up at 3 a.m., you know? So, so just things to think about. So we covered that. Um, I, I mentioned don't watch the clock. The clock tends to make people worry. Um, you'll start doing those mental cal calculations, which is uh, a, an alerting thing in your brain of, okay, it's 4 a.m., I have to be up at 6.30, that gives me two and a half hours to get to sleep right now, you know? <laughs> and so, so not good. A lot of pressure, a lot of math games. The people that turn it around, like I suggest, look at them sleeping peacefully. So, uh, <laughs> so that's your answer, guys. <laughs> and then the other piece is, Set the alarm. Even if you're used to getting up or you're getting up early, that gives your insomnia a reason to live because you might not even be aware of the fact that um, you're still like, oh, I have to get up. I can't miss it. So if you set an alarm, it takes all that, that away. And what we want be people to do is to get up very close to immediately. I know that's hard, too, for people that, you know, you're, if you're tired and you didn't have a good night. But by doing that, again, you're taking away. You don't want to spend as very little time in bed awake as possible, basically, is the rule. So that includes in the morning, in that morning time, laying there for a half hour, hitting snooze 10 times. That's poor quality sleep anyways. I'd rather see you set the alarm a half hour later, get a good another solid half hour, hit it, and get up, rather than boom, 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 hit it seven times. So 
it kind of makes sense, right? It's just um, keeping the same rise time every day. I usually start with this one for most people. It's a good kind of icebreaker place to start, and I, I highly recommend it because most people are pretty irregular. So um, the way we think about it is um, during treatment, we want it as regular as possible every day consistently. I ask people when they have to go to work to figure out what time that is or like whatever commitments they have in the morning. And then um, that applies for weekends now too. So whatever time we decide upon, it's based on any time you pick, you know, it's fine. You could pick 10 a.m. or you could pick 7 or 6 a.m. But, but we're going to make it consistent across every day. Um, that kind of helps for your body to just kind of start. It's really building in your body's cues to like know what to expect. It's going to start eventually getting easier to get up if you do that. Um, I show it from here to here of like, oh, rise and shine right away. Feel great. But most people will probably feel like this um, when they get up, kind of like an ogre. You know, it is what it is. It, we actually um, uh, have a name for it, sleep inertia, that um, it just kind of continues after you get up. So don't base how you're going to feel for the day during that first 15, 20 minutes because you still feel it. You still feel like groggy. So it's not until you get up and start moving. So, so we just know that that's biological, that most people feel that, but you can kind of push through it and just do it and you're going to get up when the clock goes off. And then I recommend things like eating a meal. If you skip, it doesn't have to be this thick meal, but uh, if you skip breakfast, um, it, there's things that can help your body's circadian rhythm and, and get it kind of going. And if you keep consistent kind of meals and eat breakfast, it's going to kind of help fine tune your body and your engine. I talked about getting light outside, the, the sunlight is great for, for our, our biological clock and setting the um, daytime hormones. And walking is good for sleep and, you know, socializing with friends. Walking is also, or exercise is good to help uh, mitigate hot flashes. So we talked about avoiding napping. So um, again, the cute little puppy. And you're wondering what Homer's doing up here, but I th it's to pry me that I think about napping like I think about, or I think about sleep like I think about appetite. So I told you we're trying to build a sleep pressure and we have to go all day long and, and not sleep. If we nap like this, it's like having your child eat a snack at 4 p.m. and then you're trying to feed them dinner at 5. Likely it's not going to happen. So your naps are actually going to offset your sleep. Chances are you're not going to have a good night's sleep that night. So if you can, avoid it altogether. I realize some people, based on taking medication or conditions, like you have to, we tweak it for different people. Pain conditions, we'll tweak it for. Um, what the general recommendation is, is to um, take your naps earlier in the day, if, if possible. It um, doesn't have to be too, too early, but you know, like maybe where the circadian dip is, like right after lunch, that would be a good time, but not 3, 4 o'clock or later. Um, and then try to keep it to 20, 30 minutes. Um, what we know about sleep physiology is that the cycle is um, about, you know, um, an hour and a half long. So, um, so if you sleep that, you're sleeping a full cycle. And just as I said, you're borrowing an hour of your time. You could do it any way you want. If you're going to use it here, that's fine, but you won't get it at night. You're also take, we get like Random, like five cycles a night of sleep, getting you from like the lighter stage, deep sleep, REM sleep. Um, that's a cycle, and, and it occurs throughout the night about five times. If you go through a full cycle and sleep, the full deep sleep, then, um, so that's where this whole power nap came from. It, it's not just kind of BS or anything. It, it really is kind of better way to sleep. So a little bit earlier if you're going to do it and, um, and do it um, shorter periods of time set an alarm if you have to, if you're doing it like you're working and then go to the car, set your phone or something. Um, preferably not at all, especially when you, if you were going through treatment, I try to have people avoid it, depending on if they feel too sleepy. So. so quieting the mind. So those are really the behavioral things that I talked about, and now I'm going to move on to some of the mental things. Um, it can be easier said than done, but there's little stra behavioral strategies that we do to help with it. Um, one of the first ones I, I talk about people is, um, I got a little light switch on here and it reminds me to talk about something we call a buffer zone. So as you're getting closer to bed, you know, people do different things. They're like preparing the meals for the next day, cleaning up the dishes, doing all kinds of things. Typically people are rush, 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 get into bed and they think it's like a light switch. Now, go to sleep. Well, our bodies don't work that way. We really need to create a time in between, that's a transition period. So I tell people 30, 60 minutes. If you have things going on, 
figure out how you can fit those things to schedule them earlier. If it's that you're making lunches for kids, then I would try to do it with dinner or something like that. Or if it's, you know, I don't even know what would be getting in the way. But so, so something light and relaxing and kind of getting you in the spirit of, of unwinding. It could be anything. It could be watching TV or reading if that's relaxing for you. But it's not rushing around and, and, um, and pacing and, and doing that stuff. So that's buffer zone, a 30, 60 minute window before bed. So even before if your bed's 11 o'clock, then, you know, 10.30 or 10 o'clock, you're doing this. So um, again, can't reiterate enough, getting ac exercise, that exercise can quiet the mind as well. It can de-stress and, and, and be helpful. Um, we recommend relaxation, either breathing exercises, which this is starting to be tested in um, hot flash data too, that, because um, you can do it anywhere. So if you can do deep diaphragmatic paced breathing, um, you could do it, you know, and there's apps out there that kind of run you through it, uh, can be helpful and it, we're actually testing it out in our study as well. Uh, yoga, thing, things that are really relaxing. And then we also, for a lot of people that worry and can't get, their, their mind is racing and they can't get it to shut off at night, I'll try, have them just try it out. I mean, it, they don't have to do all these things, but test out skills that might work for them, strategies. Uh, I have them do what we call scheduled worry. So pick time that's not anywhere near bed during the day, because like I said, a lot of times you're thinking at night. What's so funny? <laughs> It seems hokey. It sounds funny, but you know why it really works. It does. It really works. For the really longest works. time, I felt this was so hokey, too. That's why I tell people, just give it a try for a week and see if it works for you. Like, it, it may not even work for you. You know, like, it may be something that just, but what the goal of it is to get, if you're the type of person that's busy, busy, busy all day and get into some bed, this will give it a time. You create a new time for it, and it doesn't have to be long, you know, 10, 15 minutes time anywhere during the day and yeah if scheduling it helps because then it's like kind of committed but it doesn't have to be that formal it could be on your car ride of you know like that's my time to think and reflect or in your shower this way if it's like r more formal I actually have people do a piece of paper and have like problem solution and jot out all their problems then at night if you start having those thoughts you have you remind yourself that I have tomorrow this this 20 minute period that I'm gonna that it's devoted to worrying and you, you block out other times you block yourself from worrying so it works for some people, people that have this problem of it, like racing thoughts and things to do. So I don't think it's every, you know, it's not, like I said, it's not cookie cutter fits everyone, but, um, but it works for some people. And I tell people just, yeah, try it out. Like you're a sample of one, you know, see if it, it's a strategy that works for you. If not, you tried it, it's done. So um, then I had a, little, a couple little quotes. Once you know how much sleep you need, that is right for you, try not to panic if you don't get it. So uh, that's kind of a good one. The, really the kind of catastrophizing one night, bad night's sleep can get, really get in the way. So just because you don't get it, it kind of has to come on its own. And, and so um, let that process unfold. Um, tweaking a couple last things, tweaking your bedroom. Um, there's research to show that keeping, these are more related to the hot flashes now. Uh, keeping your room cooler, 68 thermostat, so you don't have to um, do the whole pulling on and off a ton of blankets. So keeping the room colder is a lot easier. Pulling on off blankets is easier to do than trying to cool a whole room at night. So keeping that cool to begin with. Um, I saw this. Have you guys heard of like crowdfunding or the crowd whatever? He, it, I guess it got enough money in, in January to, to start, but it's like some sort of air fan vent that blows right under the blanket, so, so we may have a new product. <laughs> so fans, fans in general help, you know, overhead or just putting them by the bed. Layering the bed with uh, sheets and um, extra sheets if need, maybe extra blankets so you don't have to go too far if you are the type of person that has night sweats, um, you know, having towels. Um, here, th I liked this picture because it was separate so husbands or spouses often might not like the blankets you have and I had a cute cartoon that was like is the hot flash gone away yet you know like <laughs> and I was like that too when I was pregnant it was so cold the thermostat but having let, let him layer up you know you're in the same bed he can have more blankets and then you can have less just a sheet and put it at the bottom as you need to kind of pull up sometimes you get the sweat and then if it dries you'll start feeling cold so being able to kind of pull off um, light, cool pajamas, you know, um, sweat wicking things. There's a ton of stuff on the market. I haven't like tried out all this stuff, but um, but I think it can be helpful. 
um, tweaking your habits. So we know caffeine and coffee is not great for um, hot flashes. It's kind of a hot flash trigger. Smoking is a hot flash trigger and drinking alcohol. So, um, so think about not only for sleep, but avoiding these things for hot flashes if that is going on. I mean, if you think about it, hot flashes is not, um, if you drink coffee and you're outside in Texas and it's 100 degrees, it's kind of the same idea. So, um, and exercise helps kind of protect you from that. So, and then coping with it during the day, um, layering clothes during the day, a fan, so just like maybe bringing an ice bottle to a meeting or to, to with you in like a purse or a lunch bag that you just have, just the fact of touching it. Sometimes just these little coping things can actually, I feel like help deal with when it's going on. Uh, bringing cool water to drink, obviously hot liquids. Hot liquid spicy foods are kind of, can, alcohol can all bring it on where you know cool water will be helpful. And then thoughts, kind of mantras you can tell to yourself as, as they're going on. Like this too shall pass, I know it's only gonna last this long, um, I can make it through it, tell yourself you're strong. And there's been research to sh show that attitude changes and coping actually really will change your experience with hot flashes. So, Two workbooks I just really quickly wanted to um, recommend. One is Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Menopause um, by Cheryl Green. And then this one I, I work with, uh, Rachel Mamber, she's one of my mentors, Quiet Your Mind and Get to Sleep, and it's an excellent, they're self-help workbooks, so it's kind of what we covered today, but in workbook style. And finally, my study. I have, for people that are running out, I have flyers if anybody, or brochures if anybody is interested. I mean, it, what, what I kind of described here is you got a good sense of like what the therapy is. So we're looking to test out uh, the therapy in a kind of empirically supported trial. Um, and we'll be doing that you know, over the next year. We'll be looking to recruit peri and postmenopausal women that are having trouble sleeping and are experiencing at least one hot flash a week. So um, no really age limit and it doesn't cut off of peri or post. It's free treatment and we pay you for your time and effort. So I will leave those if anyone's interested. And that is it.